Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. Genesis 9, beginning in verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Then Noah began farming, he planted a vineyard, he drank of the wine, and he became drunk. And he uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both of their shoulders, walked backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away, so they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Father, um, we love you and we love your word. We thank you that you have given us the scriptures to teach us truths about you, to reveal your son Jesus, and to teach us how to walk worthy of you. And so, Lord, would you bring to us spiritual truths that will encourage our souls. Lord, correct us if we're thinking wrongly about something. And, Lord, we just want to be fed tonight, so come and feed your sheep. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. So Noah becomes like a new Adam. New creation, right? One family. Now, we're back to one family, just like we were at the beginning. So much of this experience with Noah and his family getting off the ark is kind of like a recreation of the world. In many ways, we talked about that. And uh, so you're a descendant of Noah. Um, don't know which branch of his family you're in. We'll talk about the three branches. He only had three sons from what we know in the Bible, but you're definitely a son or a daughter uh, from this one man. So, um, but here, here's the, the sad thing is Noah up till this time has been just an amazing man of God. And yet here we have this blot, uh, really the only sin that we read of, of Noah, but it's recorded in the scriptures. And so we need to deal with that. So put this down. Learn from the sins of others. Put in the word sins and jot down 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 6. Now, referring to the people in the Old Testament, Paul is talking about the children of Israel in context and how they disobeyed the Lord, didn't have faith, and how God judged them. But the principle is much broader than just the children of Israel's sin. It applies to everything that God had recorded uh, really, in all of the scriptures. And Paul says, now these things happened, their sin and God's uh, judgment on them, as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. In other words, we're to learn from the failures of the people who sinned in the Bible, whose sin was recorded, and certainly that should be true of Noah here. Uh, here's a principle that comes from this sin in Noah's life. Put it down. We do better, we tend to do better, in the storms than we do in the calm. If you think about it, Noah just did great when it came to the, I mean, talk about a trial. The entire world is going to be judged. He's got to build an ark by faith and get his family on board and care for these animals for, you know, to go into a brave new world. And he does all that um, until, frankly, he's off the ark and the storm, the flood is over. The Bible says he who thinks he stands Take heed, what? Lest he fall. Um, quite often, it is in our trials, not always, but in our trials that we start seeking the Lord. We trust the Lord. Um, there was a movie years ago. I didn't like the movie, but I liked the title. It's called Terms of Endearment. I mean, in that case, it was about someone dying and getting right with their mom. But, but what is it going to take to get you right with the Lord? 
What's it going to take to get you seeking the Lord? And for some of us in this room, it took a tragedy. It took a crisis. I, I know one brother who's been with us since 9-11. Right after 9-11, he came to church. <laughs> and he gave his life to Jesus. He still attends here. Um, sometimes it takes a wake-up call or a, a sickness or something radical that we're going through. And uh, the old saying is there are no atheists in, in foxholes. Um, that tendency to cry out to God when you are having a struggle. And so we know this about Noah. Noah was the only man that's recorded there up to this time who walked with God and then worked for God. We talked about this, who witnessed for God. He was a preacher of righteousness while he built the ark. And then after the flood, he, he built the, the, uh, the altar and he worshiped God, but he blows it. Um, it says there in the text, let's read it again so we see what happened. Sons of Noah came out of the ark were the three sons, Shem. You know, when I say Shem's name, I'm sorry, I, I picture one of the three stooges. It's just, I, I've got to get over that. So don't you do that now that I said that. I really, I just stumbled half of you, sorry. And Ham, okay, and I have trouble with him too. I'm sorry, the, Japheth is okay. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah from these everybody that was on earth and that's on earth was the earth was populated now he tells us what happened he began farming after the flood he planted a vineyard we're all okay up to there he drank of the wine and he became drunk and he uncovered himself inside his tent the term uncovered or uncovered himself um, is here a deliberate act uh, it's, it's more than just some kind of unconscious effect of being drunk. Um, it's been said the sins of intemperance and impurity are twin sisters. Let me say that again. The sin of intemperance, we're talking about drunkenness, and impurity are, are twin. They come together. Um, interesting, the thing about Noah and Adam. There are quite a few parallels, actually, but uh, if you think about it, um, both of them are uh, rulers of a world that has been created, you might say, out of water, uh, if you think about that. They both wind up in a garden, and they both wind up sinning in the garden. And that sin leaves both of them in a naked state for which they must be covered by another, and after which uh, after their, their sin, both of them pronounce a prophecy, or a prophecy is pronounced concerning their future seed. Very interesting parallels that we, we shouldn't miss. We all know that on the battlefield, King David was undefeatable, but he blows it where? In his backyard. Not under the stress of battle. I heard a song today, maybe you know the song, I have no idea who sings it, but I like the words. It said, what if our trials in this life are his mercies in disguise. What if our trials in this life are his mercies in disguise? Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but it, it bears thinking about a little bit. Let me ask you, how could our trials in this life be God's mercies? Raise your hand if you think you might know how. Yeah. They draw us to him. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Okay, you can learn things in the trial that you otherwise wouldn't learn. Anybody else? What, what is the purpose of trials and tests? To increase our faith. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various testings or trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be complete, lacking in nothing. Again, in Romans 5, the same thing. Our trials worketh uh, perseverance. So we, we know this, that as we go through testings, God's purpose in the testing is not to destroy us, but to develop us. Uh, I like to say it this way. Tests are to do two things. They're to prove our faith and to improve our faith. That is, they bring out our faith to help us to see it. And they also grow our faith. They do both. So... It, and I like the, the words. If, if the trials in this life are his mercies in disguise, what is God doing through our trials right now? But he's bringing us closer to him, as was just said. He's giving us an opportunity to believe in him, demonstrate our faith, and to grow in our faith. And here's what the Bible says. Without faith, it's impossible to, to please God. So the greater your faith, 
you could say it this way. If a man has great faith, he pleases God greatly. And according to the Bible, we live and exist to live, to please God, to, to bring pleasure to God. It's why we exist. So as we grow in our faith and discover uh, that we're pleasing to God, it fulfills us more. It's why we're here. So I really agree with that. And here I see that in Noah, a man who during his trials is trusting God, but after the trial is over, he struggles more. And maybe you're in a time of blessing. Maybe you're in a time of peace. Some are going, nah, nah, that ain't now. <laughs> you wish it was. Be careful during that time of prosperity. It's been said prosperity, God, God, it's a bigger trial when you're going through prosperity many times than adversity because we're, we tend to forget the Lord. Read the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, there are seven cycles of God's judgment and deliverance of his people. The judges are the saviors, military saviors that God raises up. People like Gideon, people like Deborah, people like Samson. And he raises them up to deliver his people, but it's every single time that they're delivered that they only stay true to him for a short while. And then when things are going good and the enemies, whether it's the Philistines or the Midianites or whoever it is, are gone, they forget the Lord, and they go back to worshiping the gods of the land. It's very interesting. Well, in any case, we tend to do better in the storm. Certainly Noah did. Put this down, though. This is obvious. Even a saved man can still sin. Some have suggested, and I think maybe rightly so, that the recording of Noah's sin is one evidence of the inspiration of Scripture here. Why? Well, because to err is human and to cover it up is too, especially of our heroes, especially in the ancient world. If you know anything of ancient literature and mythology, the heroes are perfect. God, the, they, they, they make them perfect. They, uh, when the kings would write about themselves, they would never write about their failings. Very interesting, and yet here is Noah, a man of great faith that God chooses, and yet he is somebody who has a blot on his record. Listen to this. The children in a prominent family decided to give their father a book of the family history for a birthday present. They commissioned a professional biographer to do the work, carefully warning him of the family's black sheep problem. Uncle George had been executed in the electric chair for murder. The biographer assured the children, he said, I can handle that situation so there won't be any embarrassment. I'll merely say Uncle George occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution. He was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a real shock. So, yeah, there, there are, it's called whitewashing the black sheep. But you'll find all through scripture that God records the facts about his heroes, warts and all. He, he, he gives it all. If, if it was a human author, their failings would have either been excluded or excused. By the way, you will often hear in the commentaries and in teachings that the reason Noah got drunk was, was why? He didn't know that wine was now fermented and can make you drunk. And it's because the earth has changed, the ice canopy is gone, and now with the sun's rays, drunkenness is possible, and this is a new thing. By the way, there's just like zero evidence of that in the Bible. But people are trying to protect Noah's character. It was a mistake. Well, prove it from the Bible, because it seems to me um, there's a problem here. Uh, there's some shame involved. He did something wrong that God condemns in the rest of the Bible. So we shouldn't be uh, so easy on him here. We should learn the lesson of what God's trying uh, to teach us here. We see it all through Scripture. The things that are recorded about God's people that he's chosen. Abraham lied about his wife. By the way, so did Isaac. Lied and said his wife was his sister. Moses lost his temper. Cost him a trip to the Holy Land. Joshua jumped to a conclusion when he failed to pray about the Gibeonites. It's interesting. Every new dispensation, this is one, every new dispensation of the Bible opens with the failure of man. It always does. Interesting, we just studied about government, remember? We have government and we have capital punishment. We just studied that in the beginning of chapter 9. 
If a man sheds a man's blood, his blood is going to be shed by man because man is made in the image of God. That's God giving government for the first time. And yet, while Noah is called to govern a new world, an entire earth, he can't govern himself. That's the very first thing we discover about him. And that's to teach us this principle. Nothing will work for sinful man but a new creation, you see. No amount of external rules will ever work. There has to be something brand new. Why? Because the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all else. Well, put this down. Don't even cross the line with wine one time. First time wine is mentioned in the Bible, we read about a man getting drunk. First time. First mention of something in the Bible, by the way, is a very important thing to study. One of the principles of what we call hermeneutics or biblical interpretation is what is the first time a word or a subject mentioned in the Bible, what's associated with it? Because it's significant. Very interesting. Here it's associated with drunkenness, shame, and a curse. Later in the book of Proverbs, we'll read, wine is a mocker. In Isaiah 5, woe to him who has a reputation for drinking wine. The Japanese have a saying, first a man takes a drink, then a drink. Or then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. Think about this. Noah has withstood an evil world for 600 years. <laughs> and all the temptations and pull of it. He walks uprightly before God, and then he gives into his own flesh. And this, this principle is true. No amount of victories in your past over a sinful world can deliver you from temptations in the future. That's why he who thinketh he stands must take heed lest he fall. Now, the other thing we'll just point out is the last 350 years of Noah's life are a blank. We don't have anything recorded about them at all. Just that he lived 350 years, but nothing there. And we can maybe ask what that's all about. Now, I know that Christians argue and debate about drinking. And uh, obviously, we can agree that drunkenness is a sin. But Christians have differences of opinion about alcohol. And, and of course, we don't want to be legalistic. But sometimes I think we neglect some of the principles that are in Scripture in our fear of being legalistic. And I think that's unwise as well. You say, well, you know, I mean... Uh, I know the Bible says it's, it's wrong to get drunk, but let me just share a couple of verses with you. Revelation 1 and verse 6. Revelation 1 and verse 6 says, God has made us kings and what? Priests. Christians are kings and priests unto God. Now, you may not feel like a king. You may not feel like a priest. The Bible says you are. You're a king and a priest to God. Now, jot down Leviticus 10.9. Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you when you come into the tent of meeting. You know who he's talking to? He's talking to the priests. It's interesting. Jot down Proverbs 31 and verse 4. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Interesting. Neither kings nor priests were to drink wine, which we are called kings and priests. I'll just point that out. Six times in the New Testament... We are called to be sober, sober. The word is nepho, and it's literally, it, the word nepho literally means to abstain from wine. That's what the word means. Charles Haddon Spurgeon uh, said this about the subject. Next to the preaching of the gospel, the most necessary thing to be done in England is to induce our people to become abstainers from alcohol. In 1880, he's, uh, by this time Spurgeon had become a teetotaler himself, he said, quote, I abstain myself from alcoholic drink in every form. He preached, that which goes under the name of wine is not true wine, but a fiery brandied concoction of which I feel sure Jesus would not have tasted a drop. Had our great, he's referring to Jesus now, had our great exemplar lived under our present circumstances, surrounded by a sea of deadly drink which is ruining tens of thousands, I know he would have acted with regard to alcohol by abstaining. John Wesley warned, quote, you see the wine when it sparkles in the cup 
and are going to drink of it. I tell you, there is poison in it. Therefore, I beg you to throw it away. Uh, William Booth, who started the Salvation Army, Billy Sunday, that professional baseball player who became an evangelist, D.L. Moody, and Billy Graham were all teetotalers. They would not touch alcohol. Pastor Chuck uh, told us years ago, he said, my mother told me this when I was a little boy, Chuck, if you never even take a puff of a cigarette, you'll never be addicted. If you never take a drink of alcohol, you'll never have a problem with alcohol. You never take one puff <laughs> of a joint, you won't be, become a pothead. You know, um, Romans 14, 21, somebody says, it is good not to drink wine. I'll just point that out and uh, let you be the judge. I like what John Corson said, though. If you really want to be like Jesus, if he's our example, remember what he said. He said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine till I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So I think while you're, it's open for free, it's free, you're free, the Bible says don't use your freedom as an excuse for evil but through love serve one another. And Paul says, if my freedom would cause anybody to stumble, obviously myself included, I'll never do whatever it is. In that case, meet, meet, offered idols again. So I encourage you to consider, is this an area of my life that is a stumbling block, a temptation, uh, hurting my witness? If it's not, praise the Lord, you're free. But please, if you go, no, it kind of has been. It can be a problem. It was for Noah. And if it was for Noah, it can be for just about anybody. Put this down. Keep your nose where it belongs. Now, some of you are thinking that's what I probably should do. But verse 22. After he got drunk and uncovered himself in the privacy of his own home, right? Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers outside. Put this down. Don't be a sin sniffer a sin sniffer, or an iniquity investigator. Um, you know, it, it is easy. It is very easy to focus on other people's sins, uh, on their faults, rather than our own. Or just to focus on other people, you know. Um, it's just kind of human nature to, to see, oh, I'm just concerned, or I'm whatever. Jot down John 21 verse 20 through 22. Now, Jesus has just given a prophecy concerning how Peter was going to die. Um, Jesus has just said to him, Peter, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and you'd go wherever you want to go. But when you're old, it won't be that way. Other people will, will dress you and they'll take you where you don't want to go. And John says this was, and he's writing after the fact, Peter's already died. But he's, he's saying this was to, re, to testify how Peter was going to die, a martyr's death. So he was, Jesus, he saw, John saw that Peter's death was prophesied by Jesus. In response to what Jesus said, whether Peter understood it at the time or not, I don't know, but Peter turned around and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's who? That's John. John always records that. It's that disciple whom Jesus really, anyway, I love that. Uh, if you know Jesus loves you, it's good just to realize that. But he saw John following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper, in case you weren't sure, and said, Lord, uh, who is the one who is going to betray you? That's what John had asked. So Peter, seeing him, John, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? You're giving a prediction about me. What about him? And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. That was a very polite way of saying what? <laughs> that is none of your business. I've got your nose. <laughs> Keep it out of my business. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so... It's easy to get focused for all of us, even believers like Peter. I want to know about him. Oh, enough about me. Let's talk about him. What's going on in his life, you know? Um, so don't be a sin sniffer. And then put this down. Talk about others to the Lord. Um, because Ham goes out and he talks to his two brothers and shares his father's sin and shame. Um, there's an old song that says, You can talk about me all that you please. I'll talk about you down on my knees. Yeah. Well, that's, it's easier sung than done. But that's, that's, that's what it ought to be. You know, uh, If you're going to talk about somebody, talk to them. If you're concerned about someone's sin, man, bring that to the Lord. Intercede uh, for them. The Bible says, he who multiplies 
uh, words will find that transgression is unavoidable. And don't you see this in Scripture when sometimes people want to bring the faults of someone to Jesus that he winds up dealing with their attitude? Have you noticed that? For instance, Mary and Martha, right? Remember, Mary's at Jesus' feet listening to his word, and Martha, her interpretation of that is what? Oh, my sister's so spiritual, I wish I was like her. No. What's her interpretation? Lazy bum. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving? I'm a servant, the greatest in this house kingdom right here, you know. And Jesus says, what? Oh, Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> you are worried and concerned about so many things. You're distracted. Do you know your sister has chosen that good portion that will not be taken from? Few things are necessary, just one. Come on down, there's room at my feet for you too. The exact opposite, she was convinced Jesus would rebuke her sister and she kind of gets the loving reproof. How about the guy who says, Master, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He's being selfish, you know. He's keeping it all for himself or whatever. He's the firstborn. He won't share. And what does Jesus say? Who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And by the way, be careful about being covetous. You're being greedy. So often we think we point out the fault of somebody else, and the reality is the Lord's saying, let's talk about you. And so quite often that's the case. But put this down, let her see. Cover others shame with the garment of grace verse 23 but in spite of the fact that ham is sharing and gossiping about dad's shame shem and japheth take a garment lay it on their shoulders walk backward and cover the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away they wouldn't look at him so they wouldn't see their father's nakedness put in the word grace and the principles should be pretty out just refuse to focus on the failings of others. Oh, I know it's hard, but refuse. That's what they do here. See, we are told in James to confess our faults to one another. We are never commanded to confess the faults of others to one another. Um, when someone gossips to you about someone else, they're actually telling you more about themselves than they are the other person. And now the question becomes, what does it say about you that they believe you would want to hear that? Is that because you have in the past? Is it because you've invited it? Is it because they know? You know, we're all, we all know who we can sin with, who we're comfortable sinning with. We all know that. I want you to jot down Psalm 101 and verse 5. This is David. He says, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. Now, I don't suggest you... you know, just being biblical. You know. The Hebrew word, actually it's better translated in the King James. Him who secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will cut off. In the kingdom of God, it's not a violation to cut someone off when they're slandering somebody else in fact it's it's a biblical example and you can do it graciously somebody shares a, a fault or a sin somebody say man let's pray for him oh uh <laughs> okay <laughs> that's what i was going to suggest next after yeah right um cutting them off by the way it's fascinating i see this in the character of the lord jot down zechariah 3 first couple of verses Zechariah says, then he showed me Joshua, not Joshua the son of Nun. This is a different Joshua, but he's the high priest. Standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan was standing at his right hand. That's the position of the DA, by the way, the accuser, to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Interesting. Satan has the goods. He's got the evidence on Joshua. He's got dirty garments, which means his character has been soiled, and he's ready to accuse him. And God says, I rebuke you. Pipe down. You're not saying nothing. He does exactly what we're called to do. Just cut him off. He said, we're not going to talk about that. Instead, he's ministering grace. So put this down. Love covers a multitude of sins. That's what Peter writes about, and that's what Shem and Japheth do. They refuse to discuss, to focus on dad's sins. 
Instead, they're determined to cover his shame. Now listen, they're not trying to hide their dad's sin. There's a difference. They're willing to cover his shameful effects uh, on themselves and other people. Look, love, love does not cleanse sin. Only blood does that. Now love sheds its blood. But love doesn't cleanse sin. But love never condones sin either. But love always covers sin. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says this, love does not take into account, what? A wrong suffered. What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, you've heard me say it. You know something about it. What does that mean? Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Uh, somebody wake up and tell me. Huh? Anybody? Bueller? Anybody? Yeah. I won't hold it against them. Okay, is that it? Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Anybody else want to add to that? Is that it? Yeah. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they've done. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, love is not going to be based on their performance in your life or their failures. Anybody else? It's, it's not, yeah, go ahead. Love forgets the wrong done. Now, love doesn't necessarily really forget in the sense that I can't think of it, right? We sometimes say God forgets our sins like he goes, I don't know. Look, God does not have a bad memory bank. That's a choice. Um, the founder of the Red Cross, her name escapes me right now, but um, what's her name? Anybody know? Part, what is it? Clara yes, Clara Barton was once reminded of somebody who had done something really wrong to her by a friend. And, and she, she acted like she didn't remember it. And the person said, don't you remember what that person did? And she said, no, I distinctly remember forgetting that. <laughs> That's a good picture of what God does. He distinctly remembers forgetting what you did. And, and it's because of the cross, you see. It's a choice. It's not an inability. But love does not take into account. It chooses to not take into account a wrong suffer. Remember that, that guy who was telling his friend, my wife, every time I do something wrong, she always gets totally historical. He said, you, you mean hysterical. He said, no, historical. She brings up every time I've ever done it before. And uh, so this is, love covers a multitude of sins, but realizes that God must deal with the sin. Well, I'll put this down. We see here a family prophecy in verses 24 through 27. And, and to be honest with you, usually the focus of this is all on the curse that comes onto Canaan as a result of Ham's sin. Um, first of all, put in the word prophecy, and we really see a prediction of the future of his three sons. Real quick, anybody else know who else does this in the book of Genesis? Israel. Or Jacob. Jacob. Right there in Genesis 49, he pronounces prophetic blessings, and some don't sound like much of a blessing, but he pronounces a word describing prophetically their future of their tribes. It's very interesting. Uh, Judah, a lion's whelp. Uh, the scepter will not depart from Judah until Messiah comes. All, these prophecies come from Genesis 49. Dad prophesying, predicting their future and recorded in the Bible. We have an example of that here with Noah concerning his three sons and their, their families. So first of all, put this down. We see Canaan, and uh, we'll just put a word next to Canaan if, in your outline there. Put in the word enslavement. Canaan is the one who's going to receive this curse. Verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine, so he is sobered up now, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. Now, let me first just say what this is not, because this has been, this is one of the verses that has been perverted in its interpretation historically. Uh, it, it has been used to teach 
the, the curse on the Hamitic descendants, uh, which include those who populated Africa, uh, was actually the curse of being black. And therefore, they are going to be slaves. In fact, it was slave traders who came up with this interpretation and it made them feel less guilty. Yeah, it's biblical. That's where they're supposed to be slaves. God put this curse on their whole tribe. That is completely bunko. It is not Bible. It has nothing to do with Scripture at all. First of all, let's recognize that this is not a curse on the son Ham who told the brothers about the nakedness. Who is it a curse on? Canaan. Who is Canaan? He is the grandson of Noah. He wasn't even there. He is, by the way, not the first, second, or third grandson. He is the fourth grandson of Ham. Very interesting. It's like, what did he do wrong, right? This is really a prophetic description of the future of the Canaanite people. And, and this is really, really important. First of all, jot down Proverbs 14 and verse 9. Fools mock at sin. That's exactly what Ham has done in this text. Ham has failed to honor his father, and he is going to reap as a consequence of his sin in this same regard. He sinned as a son to his father, and he will be punished in his son. That's the picture here. The son will be compelled in his future as a result of his own character, frankly, to serve and honor others. Now, um, so this is a curse on Canaan and his descendants, who we know of as the Canaanites. Now, why might this be here in the book of Genesis? Let me ask it this way. Who wrote Genesis? Moses. Moses. Now, who is Moses ministering to? Israelites. When is Moses ministering to the Israelites? Where are they going? Promised land, otherwise known as Canaan. Who lives there? The Canaanites. And God is bringing a judgment on the Canaanite people, by the way, prophesied later in the book of Genesis to Abraham that he would bring God's, God would bring his wrath upon the Canaanite people for their sin. The Amorites, the people lived in the area of Canaan. So it's important to understand who the author is and why he wants the people of Israel to know this judgment of God on this tribe was pronounced way back in the beginning. It's important to understand that. So interesting. It's not uh, uh, the black people. It's not even the, the descendants of Ham. There were other tribes besides, other sons besides uh, uh, Canaan. I'm going to put this down number two. We have Shem mentioned and put down the word enrichment. Verse 26, he also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, Shem produces the Shemites, otherwise known as the Semites, the Semitic people. And uh, interesting what God would say to his people, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. So we have Abraham, who will come from this line, the Jewish people, all of course from Abraham, and ultimately the Messiah, that will be part of the descendants of Shem. What's interesting about him is the blessing for Shem isn't even, well, about Shem. Look at it again with me, verse 26. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his, his servant. Interesting. So the blessing is on Shem's God, who is Yahweh, Jehovah. Um, I, I love this. It's not just something that God's going to do for Shem. It, 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 when you talk about Shem, you've got to talk about the fact that who Shem's God is. Um, there's an interesting passage later in the book of Genesis um, which tells us where the 12 sons or the 12 tribes of Israel came from. Anybody, what, what caused there to be such a big family, 12 sons of, of Israel or the 12 sons of Jacob? What was the root 
that caused there to be so many sons produced? Anybody know? Jacob married two women, Rachel and Leah. He had the group on, coupon. You buy one, get one free. And he didn't just buy one, get one free. He, he got four women producing children, right? Because he got their, their handmaids, right? And so uh, what happens is in their jealousy of each other for their husband's affection are what, what I call the baby wars. <laughs> this competition to have sons. And that's how we, we wind up with, with 12 sons. And uh, of course, you know, only uh, Joseph and Benjamin are actually the sons of Rachel, the, the woman that he married. But uh, Bilhah and, and, and uh, Zelha, these, these women that are concubines are brought in by these wives to produce other sons. When, when they go barren, it's like, well, we, gotta, we can produce some more, you know. And, um, but what's interesting about that story that I think about when I think of this text of the blessing that's on Shem, which is really on the Lord, is Leah. You know, Leah was not his choice. Um, he, 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 he married Leah, well, he was married to Leah and winds up waking up after the honeymoon night and finds out that he is not, he didn't marry Rachel. Now, ask me how that happened, you know, like, what did that happen? Was it really dark? Did she disguise her voice? Did he have a little too much? Is this another Noah story? I don't know. I'm just telling you what happened. Don't have that info. When you get to heaven, you can ask. But Leah starts producing children. Rachel doesn't at first. First son of Leah is Reuben. Now, she's named Reuben because when this son is born, his name means God sees. And she says, God has seen uh, my plight because she doesn't feel loved by her husband and because she, she knows he wanted to marry Rachel. So she feels like God's vindicating her. So she says, my son is, is Reuben because God's looking at what's happening here and knows it's not, not, not fair and he sees that I'm unloved. Then she produces another son. She names him Simeon, uh, which means to hear. And she says, God has heard uh, that I'm hated. You know, by, by Rachel is what she's talking about. So God's given me a second son. Then she has a third son, Rachel's still barren, named Levi. Levi, by the way, means to intertwine. Okay, it means to intertwine. And she's, or to be joined. And she says, now that I've had three, now that my husband, Jacob, sees that I've had three sons, his heart will be joined to mine. And you can just see every, every one of these sons is like, this is it, this is gonna do it. She has one fourth son. Anyone know what his name is? Judah. You know what Judah means? It means praise the Lord. And she says, this time, I'm just going to praise the Lord. It seems like it took that fourth one for her to finally say, I'm going to give up this whole idea of getting my husband's affection. I'm just going to praise God. And then she stopped bearing. Very interesting story. But I look at that and I think of this son Shem. And the blessing on Shem is actually a focus. It's all about Shem's God. It's all about the Lord. You might put it this way. The person who's really blessed is the one who says, it's, it's not about me at all. It's all about him. Kind of like this. Whatever Shem will possess is God's gift. Whatever blessing that is brought into his life is God's grace. It's all about him. My, uh, my grandson is seven. The other night he was upset. I don't recall why. Probably he wouldn't either. But he was in his bed and he was upset. And when I came up, whatever he was upset about, here's how it expressed itself in Jonah. He said, what's the point of living? <laughs> you guys have no compassion. I did not laugh when he said that, just so you know. <laughs> and I calmed him down and talked to him. And, but the next morning, I had been thinking about what he said. And so I said, Jonah, come over. It was in the morning before he went to school. I said, Jonah, come here. He said, what? I said, come sit on Papa's lap. He said, all right. I go, do you know what I'm going to say to you? He said, yeah, you're going to tell me you love me. You always say that whenever you call me over to you. I thought, oh, praise God. I hope you never forget that in your life, that that's why your grandpa called you over. I, 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 I'm glad for that. But that's not what I want to tell you. I do love you, I said. 
But I want to answer your question that you asked last night. Because you said, what is the point of living? And I said, you know what? That's actually a question that is actually answered in the Bible. Very specifically. And by the way, I said, a lot of people, a lot of adults, they go through their whole life and they never know the answer to that question. And so I had his attention. I said, the point of life, the point of your life is to glorify God. I go, do you know what it means to glorify God? He goes, yeah, I, it means to be his reflection. I said, that's not bad. I said, it actually means to make him famous. You are, you exist to make God known. And I said, the way you do that is by getting to know him and making him known. That is why you're on this earth, Jonah. And a little smile came over his face. Can I tell you something? That's what's going on here with Shem. Shem's blessing is that God's name would be known. By the way, the name Shem, the word Shem, it means name. That's what it means. It means name. Shem is called to preserve the name, the name, not just a name, not his name, the name of God. I love that. And by the way, um, although he is listed first, he was born second, which is very interesting to me because don't we see this pattern all through the Bible? God chooses Abel, who is the second born, instead of Cain. Isaac, the second born, instead of Ishmael. Jacob, the second born, instead of Esau. And Ephraim, the second born, instead of Manasseh. What's the principle? God honors the second birth. That which is flesh is flesh. You must be born again, you see. That's who God chooses. Well, verse 27 May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Put this down next to Japheth's name. The word that we'll put next to him is enlargement. Enlargement. By the way, the name Japheth in Hebrew means to make big, to make roomy. The descendants of Japheth include the Greeks and the Romans who conquered the known world. The Anglo-Saxon, many of you in this room, Japhethites. That's who we are. And very interesting, the Anglo-Saxons would go on to conquer and inhabit more territory by far than the other two combined. And God is predicting that right here as they moved into Asia Minor, it's all of Europe, and it's really the forefathers of all the Gentile nations. Very interesting. Although successful in military conquests, the Japhethites, when it comes to spiritual things, they will dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, interesting to me, in the book of Acts, the book of Acts records all three branches of Noah's family in Acts 8, 9, and 10, or a representative coming to faith in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, we have the Ethiopian eunuch. Which family would that be of? Well, that's Ham's family. And he comes to faith in Jesus, remember, as Philip shares the gospel. In Acts chapter uh, 9, of course, we have Paul's conversion. And, uh, and he's a Semite. He's a, a, of the tribe of Shem. Uh, obviously, he's a Jew. Acts chapter 10... Peter goes to the home of Cornelius, the Italian stallion, you know, of the Italian battalion, and uh, preaches the gospel to a Gentile, and he would be of the family of Japheth. Very interesting. All three families of God uh, that, from Noah are being represented in the book of Acts in three chapters and coming to faith in Jesus Christ, the same Savior. Finally, put this down. See that God is giving you time in your life to start over. I want you to see how this finishes. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. While we don't read what he did, we do read that he lived. By the way, Noah lived the longest. Uh, he was number three on the longevity chart. He was uh, 20 years older than Adam was when Adam died. 19 years younger than Methuselah was when he died. So he lived extremely long, but 350 years after the flood, and then it says all the days of Noah were 
950 years, and he died. Now, an interesting fact, if you look at the genealogies concerning Noah, that you may not know of, he uh, lived for 58 years of Abraham's life. You don't read of them crossing over, but in fact, for the first 58 years of Abraham's life, Noah was still alive. So it is actually quite possible that Abraham could have heard the story of the flood from Noah himself. Kind of interesting. Um, we don't have any reason to believe Noah, you know, and he became a drunkard. I mean, we don't have anything like that. We have one instance. It's really sad if you think about it. And I want to suggest to you, it only takes one time to really mess up your reputation. This is what's recorded. Nothing else in his life. But I have every reason to believe Noah walked with the Lord after this time. I don't have any reason to doubt that. He is mentioned in the New Testament as a man of faith and a man who walked with God. Um, Alexander White, who was a Scottish divine or a, a preacher and scholar, 19th century, once said this, the, victor the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. It is. It's a series of new beginnings. And even though Noah had come through a saved man, he blows it, but it wasn't the end of his life. He had time and an opportunity to do things right. I'll close with a story that I love to share because I think it's encouraging, at least it is to me. On New Year's Day, 1929, Georgia Tech played the University of California in the Rose Bowl. During the first half of the game, a player by the name of Roy Regals recovered a fumble for California on his own 35-yard line. In evading some of the Georgia Tech tacklers, Regals became confused. He started running 65 yards in the wrong direction. One of his teammates, Benny Lom, outran him and tackled him on the one-yard line just before Regals was about to score for Georgia Tech. That strange play came near the end of the first half. Everyone watching the game was asking the same question. What will Coach Nibs Price do with Roy Regals in the second half? The players filed off the field and trudged into the dressing room. They sat down on the benches and on the floor, all but Regals. He pulled his blanket around his shoulders, sat down in a corner, put his face in his hands, and he wept like a baby. A coach usually has a great deal to say to his team during halftime. But that afternoon, Coach Price was quiet. No doubt he was trying to decide what to do with Regals. Then the timekeeper came in and announced there were three minutes before playing time would re re uh, come before playing time, Coach Price looked at the team and said simply, men, listen to this, the same team that started the first half will start the second. The players got up and started out all but Roy Regals. He didn't budge. The coach looked back and called him again. Still, Regals didn't move. Price walked over to Regals and said, Roy, didn't you hear me? The same team that started the first half will start the second. Roy Regals looked up. His cheeks were wet with tears. Coach, I can't do it. I've disgraced you, I've disgraced the University of California, I've disgraced myself. I, I couldn't face that crowd to save my life. Coach Nims Price put his hand on Regal's shoulder and said, Roy, get up and go on back. The game's only half over. Roy Regal's did go back, and those tech players testified that they had seldom seen a man play as Roy Regal's did in the second half. God is the God of the second chance, and the third chance, and the fourth chance. No matter what you've done or how far you've fallen. And by the way, I love the fact in this text, Noah was a saved man. Can we all agree? Biblically, he was a saved man who went out and got drunk and was really sorry he did. And it didn't become the character of his life, but it is in the record that God wasn't done with him because he fell and he's not done with you as a saved person because you might fall. He's ready to say, hey, game's only half over. The story's not done. It's time to start again.